you are representing it. So welcome everyone. How many of you are coming for the first time? Okay. So some of you have uh, attended this lecture before, right? See, I did a lecture on them. Okay. So you guys know, right? Professor will come. They will give you know very easy language talk. Uh, try to get your interest in the level. So today we have Professor Ankesh Jain. He is from the Electrical Engineering Department. He is retired. That is his last I think five years. Five years. He did his PhD. We come Professor here to PhD. He did his PhD from IIT Madras. Then he went for some postdoctoral study in Germany. And after that he came here and joined IIT Delhi. So he works mostly on circuits and all these signal circuits. So I think he will be a better position to tell you about his research. So I think I will not uh, do any more delay. So let's, uh, you know, maybe. <laughs> okay. So uh, just to introduce you with the word circuit. So uh, this circuit is not essentially related to electronics. Circuit is basically any closed network where lot of component or individual entity can be there, like uh, sur circuit can be of wood also, right? So this is a very generic term, but here in this particular context, I am going to talk about mostly circuit of electronic devices. Okay. So why do we need to understand about circuit? The uh, answer to that question is that whether you know or don't know, but uh, you will be using a lot of circuits in your day-to-day -day life. For example, nowadays uh, you might be carrying a mobile, right? Inside your mobile there is plenty of electronic circuits. You watch TV, TV cannot run without electronic circuits, right? So in, in fact nowadays every device you can find there is some or other kind of circuit inside right you might not be noticing it but there will be some sort of circuit and uh, the reason why do we need is because much automation actually happens through circuit right for example let's say your washing machine is running and uh, after uh, once the washing cycle is over it just uh, give you some signal, maybe some beep or something and you get to know that washing cycle is now over, right? How, how, the, how does that happen? How it is counting the time? In fact, even your clocks, nowadays you have digital clock, how it is counting the time? So much of this depends on uh, circuit design, right? So if you try to look uh, these electronic circuits, like in this picture you can see a lot of electronic components are there and these components are essentially assembled on a board which is known as PCB or printed circuit board. Right? So PCB is just like a platform where you can put all these electronic components in the desired way so that it can perform whatever task you want to perform to it. Right? So, um, I, like if you want to know exactly like how to design a circuit for some particular function or some particular operation, that is a slightly uh, uh, more involved task. Like for that, you have to first understand how these individual component works and uh, when we interconnect them, like what kind of operation is going to happen. So in this lecture, because this is the, just an introductory le lecture, I am not going to go into that discussion. I will just superficially touch like different different uh, uh, types of circuit or uh, uh, like uh, just try to give you an overview of it. Okay. So uh, right now like in this uh, PCB, like this printed circuit board or PCB, you can see like in fact if you open up your mobile or let's say if you open up your television inside that you can find these kind of boards and you can notice them easily right however the complexity of electronic circuits right now has increased tremendously so what do i mean by that the dimension in which we are currently designing our circuits 
So these dimensions are now extending in nanometers. So basically the precision at which you can design your circuit components, right? That's in nanometer. And nanometer you understand it is like 10 power minus 9 meter, right? So that means even a very tiny uh, block which may be let's say 1 mm by 1 mm, right? 1 millimeter by 1 millimeter. Inside that you can have billions of transistors which is essentially a electronic component, right? So you can so heavily pack electronic components within such a tiny space and because of that you can perform very complex operation because such a complicated circuits are present. Right? So does it make sense? Like, like for example if you look at your computer. So although computer from outside may slightly look bigger like for example this is my laptop but the core of this laptop right that will be a tiny electronic circuit maybe uh, 1 centimeter by 1 centimeter area and that is generally known as processor right so processor is the core of uh, computer and inside that processor again if you uh, obviously if you even if you break it you won't be able to uh, make much sense of it but if you uh, cut it open and try to look it through microscope then you will find that inside that you will see a structure which is the structure very similar to like a building there are like several buildings kind of a structure will look like I will show you those pictures but I am just trying to tell you the perspective okay another thing is that circuits can be wearable also so what does that mean one kind of so, uh, circuit can be designed using a PCB. So let's say you take a PCB, you place electronic components over it, you connect them in desired fashion. But this PCB is generally rigid, right? So now let's say if you want to be a, like put it uh, on let's say human body, so that that will not be a very comfortable thing. But there is a possibility that you can use some substrate which is flexible, so that this PCB can be bandaged and it can be uh, like you can wear it like a normal cloth, right? So in that case it becomes very attractive because let's say if I want to design some sensing circuitry, right? And this sensing circuitry want to sense let's say suppose your blood pressure. So I want to design this sensing circuitry such that you can easily wrap it over your hand or uh, let's say around the neck and then you can keep on sensing without uh, feeling any uncomfort due to it. Right. So, I think I, so in fact in this picture you can see, I have tried to show you like rigid PCB and flexible PCB. So you can see the flexible PCB can be banded and on that also circuit can be printed. Right. So when you want to design something especially for a bio application where let's say it has to be placed over a body or something, you can use this flexible PCB so that the circuitry can be designed over it. Okay. Now, whenever somebody want to get introduced with a circuit design, right? So, this structure which we are seeing here, like this structure, is the first thing they try exploring uh, for uh, or making uh, yourself aware with the circuit design. This board has nothing to do with circuit. The board is just a platform where you can uh, assemble several circuit components. So, like this is a circuit component, this is another circuit component and this board is just a method of connecting these circuit components with each other, right? So for example, every row, like this, this top row, if you see, all these dots are shorted. So shorted means if I insert a component in one of these holes and let's say if I insert another component in this next hole because this is internally shorted so they will be get they will get connected as if you are connecting a wire between them right so this is just a method of connecting different components right and this is known as breadboard right so breadboard is a you can say a method to dis like design circuit very easy because you need not to use like uh, too many like in fact your circuit 
because it is on a platform. So even if you try to shake it, it will not get disturbed easily or wire will not come out from each other. Right? So most of the time you will find that in lab, whenever you will get introduced with the circuit design, you will be given a breadboard and you will be given a component, maybe some wires and then you will try to connect these components using this breadboard. Okay? This <coughs> on the left side is also a circuit. But this circuit is like a uh, hard wire on a board and this board is actually PCB. One PCB I showed you earlier. This is also a PCB. So PCB is essentially again a board. But then on this board, whatever connection you want to make, you print them those connections. And then you place components. So because these connections are printed, right? So this is like much more robust. Like Everything is printed and then you put these components and you basically solder these components. So soldering is a way of hard fixing these components on this board. Right? So now this is much more robust circuit design. But all these circuit design you can appreciate because you are able to notice it. Right? However, the problem here is that you can use component which you can handle yourself. So you can handle any component which may be like visible through eyes, right? But let's say if component becomes very small, for example, if I start talking about a transistor which is extending in dimension of several nanometers, you cannot even see it, right? In fact, it, it may not be possible to handle it like uh, just by hand without providing a protection to it. So when you want to work at such dimension, right? You don't work in this way. Rather, what you do is you take a material called silicon. Like this material can be some other material also. You basically take a platform kind of thing, and on this platform, you try to make pattern so that you can create a desired circuit, and this whole thing happens like all all this fabrication process happens through machine no human contact like everything is like automated and once this whole device is fabricated then this device will be encapsulated in some like uh, ceramic package and then this whole package will come to you and this will be considered like a single component which can be your processor or maybe like in PCB several times you see a black color uh, component which you call chip. So that chip is essentially this uh, thing. How exactly it look like? I can show you some pictures. So for example this picture. So this picture try to show you like if I am looking from the front. How these ICs look like? So you see like there are these several white color patterns. So all these white color patterns are essentially metal and you can see it, it looks like as if there are several floors, right? You can notice lower side and in between here you, wherever you are seeing this black color. So that black color is essentially insulation or insulator because if you let us don't have an insulation between different metals then everything will get torted, right? So you have several metal layers, in between the insulation is there and wherever you want to make connection, for example here, you see here the two metals are kind of connected to white color. So that means there is a connection, right? So this is exactly like a building where you have several floors and let's say if from one floor to other floors you want to go, then you can have something like a lift. Right? So this, this uh, several place if you see, you can find wherever the connection is there, here you can find that there is some metal going from one layer to other layer. And that's how you create a uh, pattern in this. In fact, if you want to see from another view, so this is like from a top view, the same IC is like routing has been shown. And you can see like maybe this is one component and then you are taking a connection from here, then you are taking this connection. Now the only point is, 
the the dimension like these dimension if you try to uh, see these dimensions are very like uh, very small like they may be in uh, few uh, uh, few tens of nanometer or so right so such a dense packaging of these routing or these individual component happens that's why you are able to get so many functionality from such a tiny chip okay in fact uh, if i talk about how the industry got developed is in the beginning let's say maybe electronic circuits were operating uh, let's say several hundreds of micrometer okay and this was i am talking about maybe around 1970 or so so around 1970 when the components were designed they were being designed using this dimension 100 micrometer and multiples of it then people thought that if we can reduce the dimension of our device then we can pack more device in the same area so we can get more functionality out of it okay if you want to do that right you have to figure out how you can reduce the size of the device that comes under research so for example i am a circuit designer there are people who work on individual devices so their task is how to make device even smaller and smaller right so they are doing research on how to make a smaller device which can function in the same way so these people have done research and they came up with okay now instead of 100 micrometer i am able to design the same device with a dimension of 50 micrometer correct okay? so once this person comes with this idea like right? he obviously you can also ask the question here that why not in the beginning this person start thinking about how to design a device with 1 nanometer instead of 50 micrometer because you want to reduce the size ultimately so why not directly to 1 nanometer why you are jumping like from 100 micrometer to 50 micrometer then you will try again reducing it from 50 to let's say 25 why not directly to 1 nanometer the answer to that is you can uh, extrapolate things in a slightly neighborhood for example if i ask you what kind of world you can see next year your answer may be somewhat accurate but let's say if i ask you what kind of world will be there after 1000 years so i am not sure if any of us will be able to correctly answer that because extrapolation works in a narrow range right not in a wide range because there can be several factors which can affect things and it is very difficult to predict them in such a wide range okay for example think about covid covid has affected all of us in a drastic way and who would have thought 10 years before that such kind of event can also happen right so in a long span things several different things can happen and it is very difficult to predict so that is the reason why whenever people try to do some research they try to go slightly away from whatever you are currently and not too far right that is not a very wise decision if you are trying to do something which is completely different from what you have today okay so what they did is they come up with a device of 50 micrometer let's say they took a time of one year in doing this okay excuse me yeah so many small cells mm. how do you use this small cells every time they use microscope no so that's why i said this is not handled by human any longer so i will come to that how you are fabricating this and how you are using it. i will come to that don't worry okay so at least this part is clear that they are moving slowly slowly but anyway once they come to 50 micrometer now they can start designing the device for 25 micrometer let's say they can further reduce it because now you are not going from 100 to 25 you are going to from 50 to 25 but unfortunately 
you cannot start right away and there is no scientific reason for that rather the reason is economy when you have done research and you came up with 50 micrometer device you have invested lot of money and nobody is giving you money without generating money so now when you are at 50 micrometer the industry says okay you invested money whatever money you have invested give me at least 10 times of that then only i can give you more money for doing research you understand see scientists are always in, uh, interested in doing research so once they came up with device which can work at 50 micrometer they are interested in now getting a device which can be of let's say 25 micrometer dimension but scientists don't have money for doing things money is generated by industry right so industry is giving them money for doing research so sometimes this process is also like you can see the rate of development of this process is not just limited by our capability rather it is also limited by economy so once you have like generated enough money so that you can repay whatever amount you have taken for research then a further money will be given to you and you can again start doing the work so even after these constraint this development in electronics industry is very significant significant in the sense that the industry on an average took 18 months to 24 months from moving like let's say one technology node these are like these dimensions are generally termed as technology node so they have kind of reduced the dimension by a factor of root 2 in every 18 to 24 months and this was also very significant yes so when they invented or discovered the 25 nanometer circuit then will the 50 nanometer circuit be useless then it's i will not say it is useless but let's say if you have a flexibility to pack more device in the same area right so people would not like to use the other one for example right now let's say you have a tv or not tv let's say mobile available right and in your home you like i don't know how many home are now having those uh, land light on which are slightly bulky so which one you want to carry like the smaller one or the bigger one given both gives you same functionality see if if a bigger bigger device also giving you same functionality smaller device also giving you same functionality so everyone would like to carry the smaller thing right so so i think the tendency is there but it is not like that is useless sometimes there can be a scenario where you are constrained by cost and it may happen the older technology is cheaper the advanced technology is more costly so you want to go with a older technology because you want to operate at a lower cost right but you, you understand because this technology was developing so fast so after a time it may happen that a much older node may become obsolete because even the newer technology may become cheaper right so that that actually has a so so you now understood like this this uh, phase was like the device dimension was sharply reducing right and in fact not just the dimensions were reducing the performance of device also keeps on improving every 18 to 24 months right so every 18 to 24 months it's like your device size is reducing and your device is able to operate at a faster speed so i am not sure how many of you have followed the development of computers but if you see the computers let's say from 90 1990 to 2010 you will see the speed of processor every like 18 to 24 months it was kind of getting doubled so what if like let's say earlier it was 100 kilohertz then it became 200 kilohertz then it became 400 kilohertz and what is what is the meaning of this see when you say speed of processor that means if you are giving a instruction to it and let's say it is taking 
three clocks in executing this instruction and if clock become faster right these these processes are generally run with clocks so clock is basically the clock is defining a time period so if you say the clock speed is becoming faster that means now my time to do execute the same instruction is reducing so if my frequency is increasing i am doing the same instruction in a lesser time and that is very very nice thing for example if you guys like you guys are still very young so i am not sure how many of you have seen the era when browsing on a mobile phone just started for example we used to have 2g right so at that time if you oh, want to browse a page how much time it used to take even a simpler page right and you see today even if you want to watch a movie it is stream so efficiently so how this is happening this is happening because your circuits are now working at a much faster rate right if in, in fact if you try to think like uh, uh, in mobile like for example you have these generation 2g 3g 4g 5g right so what is the meaning of these generation with every generation the the speed at which your data is moving that is becoming faster and faster so now you are able to, like for example in uh, 3g i think you were able to operate somewhere around uh, hundreds of megahertz now in 4g you are even operating at gigahertz so so you are basically sending more and more data right and again here you can ask the question that why not we are making this invention or what is limiting the rate of this invention so again here the rate of inventions are not just limited by the capability it is also limited by economy because whenever a new generation let's say for example your 4g or even 5g got invented maybe 3 4 years back itself but we have not yet moved to 6g why it is not like that we don't know what kind of circuitry or what kind of system we need for 6g in fact we have some of those systems already there but this whole thing is also governed by economy till the time you are not generating the revenue from the previous technology you don't like to move unless there is a very stiff competition sometimes it may happen there are multiple players and this other players in order to rule over the market they want to say okay i am now launching a new technology okay in in, in fact this technology war is like uh, very interesting for example there was a time when uh, this uh, mobile phones were not so common in fact the mobile phones were invented for military operation not for uh, uh, civil civil operation so military uh, used to use this even before uh, civilians started using it and during that time there was one company motorola so motorola came up with an idea that uh, what if we launch several satellite which will revolve around earth and then we will have a device which will operate based on satellite communication so you can say they these are like sort of satellite phone and they actually launched several satellites and uh, they were planning to then launch these satellite phones but exactly at that time another company uh, i think it was nokia they actually uh, made some alliance with the darpa which was military organization and then they this cell cell phone device came into uh, public forum so just because of this motorola suffered a heavy loss and because the motorola was not a company which was interested in running satellites they launched the satellite just so that they can sell their phones right so they have to ultimately sell off all these satellites so that uh, because they have no use and now their satellite phones were not so popular because they were more like they were costly compared to the other cellular phones 
So sometimes this technology war is lot more governed by the economy. So it is not just the technology which decides how things are coming to you. Sometimes it is the economy also. In fact, nowadays you must have seen that uh, uh, the world semiconductor is uh, coming in news a lot, right? In India is moving uh, in the manufacturing of semiconductor. So why this word is like being heard only now because semiconductor is not something very new. Semiconductor is in the market maybe since last 20 or 30 years. So India is actually a leader in semiconductor design. So one thing is like circuit design. So India is a leader in that domain. But unfortunately, we do not manufacture semiconductors. So we design these, like we are expert how to design circuitry. But if we want to manufacture these circuitry, we have to send all those things outside India. For example, one of the place where we get the semiconductor design fabricated is in Taiwan. T, uh, TSMC is the foundry where most of the semiconductor manufacturing happens across the world. And this thing was running very fine. Uh, like they were able to supply uh, a very uh, uh, things in a very lesser cost. So there was no issue. But when COVID came, in fact, not just COVID, even before that, due to political war, right? Due to politics, sometimes it happens that let's say if the manufacturing is happening in a certain country and this country is not very favorable to you. So what if they stop supplying you the semiconductor design or they stop manufacturing it for you? And also as many of you must have now realized because these designs are so tiny. So and there are so much things, have so much uh, uh, complexity inside it. So even if somebody, let's say, modify your design. So you send some design, but inside that they put some design like which can take control away from you. For example, you might not might have read the news some two three day back that pagers start getting exploded, right? So how this can happen? Like you have a circuit, how do you know what is going in? See, as a user, you are just buying it, and the company might be taking this semiconductor from some other country. So the check is very difficult here. So until and unless you have a safe manufacturing facility at least for critical application right see normal usage application you can rely but for example let's say you have a missile and this missile also has a circuitry inside it and now what if the control has been taken by someone else especially the country where it got manufactured then this can be risky thing right so because of all these reasons you want to at least manufacture semiconductor for strategic and critical application. That's why now several countries, not just India, many countries in Europe, India, they are pushing that we want to develop some facility so that at least for critical application, we can manufacture, we can manufacture these devices in-house so that we can have a better control on it. So this is this area is very important because not just for uh, commercial application but for your defense. In fact, uh, as I told, as the time will progress, you will be surrounded more with electronics. Now electronics is penetrating even inside your body. You have a pay, like many people have pacemakers, right? So pacemaker is basically providing a pulse to your heart. What if the control is taken by someone else? Now even inside brain you are putting electronics. Inside eye we are putting like nowadays it is possible that you can design a retina which is completely artificial, which is essentially a circuit, right? So this circuit essentially excites your neurons and that's how you see even if your retina is damaged. So nowadays lot of electronics is going inside the body at places where the data can be misused also, right? So security of electronics is a very critical topic nowadays. And because of that, 
you should be having the full fledged facility where you can manufacture and you can design. Okay? Alright, so let me move ahead from this point. So, like these are some of the designs which, in fact, uh, we did in our lab. So, this is like uh, one chip which is designed by us, and this is a ADC. ADC is analog to digital converter. So, I am not sure if you are aware with it, but I will give you what is analog, what is digital. You might have heard these terms. Analog and digital are not uh, uh, terms which you only hear in engineering, but you also hear it in uh, commercial world because many devices are analog devices, many devices are digital devices. In fact, nowadays you will notice most of the devices are digital devices, right? Digital camera and everything. So, let me tell you what is analog. Analog actually came from word analogous. Anything which is analogous to real world, that is analog. So, digital doesn't exist in real world. For example, if you are seeing this picture, this picture is essentially a signal and this signal is analog signal. I am speaking, my voice is an analog signal. So any signal which exists in real world are analog signal. The problem with analog signal is that analog signal can take any magnitude. Like if you look at amplitude of the signal, it is allowed to take any amplitude, right? Because as, as in real world, like I am speaking, I can speak at a, a louder voice, I can even uh, slow down my voice, right? So it is, it can take any amplitude. So the problem with such a signal is, if some disturbance comes, let's say if somebody is speaking in the next room and I am speaking here, so that signal can disturb my signal because the moment that, that disturbance comes, effective amplitude changes, my information is getting disrupted. Right? So, analog signals are very sensitive to noise. So, any disturbance comes, it kind of gets corrupted. So, you define another kind of signaling which is not a signaling existing in real world, it is just a mapping. So, this mapping you say that you have some signal and you will just define a threshold. And now you say, if your signal is below threshold, I will call it a zero. If my signal is more than this threshold, I will call it a one. So now you are giving a digit, like using zero and one. And zero and one are essentially digits. So this kind of signal is known as digital signal because it can be represented using digits. You understand? So basically, your actual signal is like this, you have assumed some threshold and you have said if my signal is below threshold, I am calling it as 0, if my signal is more than this threshold, I am calling it as 1. So this is just a mapping. Your signal actually is like this, but when you are mapping it, you are calling it as 0 and 1. Now later on if you want to process it, you just process it in terms of 0 and 1. And because the 0 and 1 has such a wide margin, so if some small disturbance comes, they are not going to affect. Because let's say if you have 0 and you have 1 and your threshold is 0.5, until and unless your disturbance or noise is not more than 0.5, you will not move from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0. You understand this, right? Because if you are, if you are assuming signal is 0, the even if noise is of 0.4 magnitude, your signal will become maybe 0 plus 0.4, so 0.4. So you are still below threshold, so you will still consider this as 0 ohm, right? So the good thing about digital signals are, digital signals are very robust with respect to noise. You understand? So that's why you see all the appliances and all everything around you is Digital working in digital domain, like for example, digital camera, right? So, these digital camera, what they are doing is you are taking a picture, you are then mapping the brightness of this picture in terms of 0 and 1, and then you are processing those 0 and 1 
and finally after processing you are showing the picture so in this processing duration because you are playing with zeros and ones so the effect of noise is not that much affected right so i am just giving you a very superficial uh, understanding like the if if you want to understand it fully you have to go uh, go into much more complexity right now that is not possible so i am just giving you how things are actually happening inside the camera which is especially digital cameras this is another example of wearable uh, uh, electronics like uh, a person is just having the electronics uh, you you understand like the, the way you wear uh, any bracelet or uh, something this it can be just go like this and then uh, for example in this case uh, this thing uh, this is essentially a uh micro fluidic pdms chip which basically is sensing lot of information related to your muscle movements and all okay another interesting thing which you can do is like in fact which my research group also does is see for running any circuit like for example you have cell phones and you have uh, you may have like uh, television or any any device you need some power like for example cell phone has battery right uh, you you operate cell phone and after a time your battery goes away so many time uh, especially in sensing application you put sensor at such a place where let's say after a time when the battery is over and if you want to change the battery it may not be so practical to go there and replace the battery Right, or it may be very costly because you have to send some manpower, and this manpower has to uh, change the battery. Right, so obviously some cost is involved. So recently, people start exploring that in our ambient environment, there are a lot of energy sources. Obviously, like sun is there, so energy of sun can be harvested using a solar cell. But even inside this room. actually there are a lot of vibrations why these vibrations are there because of uh, because of movement and uh, uh, so let's see uh, we, we are here we we are not sitting idle even if we look that we are sitting idle but still some move, some movement are there because of that some vibrations will be there and these vibrations you can design devices which can convert these mechanical vibration back into electrical energy so it is possible to create devices which can generate electrical energy from the ambient mechanical energy present in the environment itself right so such devices are known as energy harvester because they can harvest the energy from the ambient air. so i am not saying the energy is generate getting generated from nothing the energy is already present in your environment we are just converting that energy into electrical energy so that we can use it okay so for example this is uh, a device which we have like uh, which one of my collaborator designed because obviously i am not a device uh, designer i am a circuit designer but then we have worked on uh, circuits for it so what is this device i will explain so actually this is or maybe let me take this so basically they like whenever you take two materials and you let's say bring these two material into contact of each other then some electron exchange happens between these two material does it so most of the time if the electron affinity of these two materials are very different then the number of electrons which actually gets exchanged will be more right this you might have noticed like for example especially if you take a woolen cloth and if you try to rub it on your uh, hand then even if you take it far you will find that your uh, hairs will uh, like uh, it will uh, it will be standing on your uh, body surface so that happens because there is some charge right so this charge exchange effect is known as triboelectricity so now what we do is we take two materials and one of that material let's say we fix it on a surface and other material is 
set in such a way that it can vibrate. So now, when your ambient vibration, right? As I told you already that in our environment, the vibrations are there. Now, due to these vibrations, this other electrode will sometimes come into contact of this and then it will go off, right? Depending on vibration. So whenever this will come into contact, some electron exchange will happen. And whenever electron comes here, we will pass on these electrons to our circuit. You understand? So it is like electrons are moving and flow of electron is nothing but that is a current. So basically a current is being generated. You understand? So this device essentially is able to convert vibrations into a current. And now what we can do is, whatever this tiny current is coming, we can constantly charge a battery using this. See, although this current is very tiny and uh, uh, the question is how can you efficiently charge a battery? But that question can be solved by people like me who are circuit designer. This is our day to day job to come up with circuits which can efficiently do the desired operation. Right? So we know this, how to do that. Uh, in fact, I think I have one analogy to explain you how exactly we do this. Yeah. Did you discuss some of these of the program we attended lecture by Professor Amkur? Mm -hmm. He also talked about piezoelectricity where there are two sheets like this right. and when we press them, electricity is generated. Right. So are they the same? They were the same. Uh, yes, so that, that's a very good question. In fact, uh, 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 you could answer, you could ask this because you have attended that lecture. So there are different category of energy harvesting mechanism. Like, uh, uh, like triboelectricity is one kind of uh, mechanism. So all these mechanisms can be broadly classified in three categories. So as you mentioned, this piezoelectricity is one category. That second category I will not call triboelectricity. Rather, that is known as electrostatic mechanism. So this triboelectricity comes under the category of electrostatic energy harvester and then there is third category which is electromagnetic. So in fact, uh, this I can explain you, suppose you have a magnet and if you take a coil, sorry, so if you, if you have a magnet and if you take a coil, now let's say magnet is static and coil is allowed to move. Then at least I think in your 12, those who are in 11th or 12th class, they must have uh, studied the Faraday's law. You will see the number of flux lines, right? They will change, which is passing through this coil if the coil is moving in the magnetic field. And because of that also, some electric current will get generated because if the flux associated with the coil is changing. So this is through this way also you can generate electricity. So these are just the different method of generating electricity. Now the question is which one we should use? So clearly there is some comparison in terms of energy density. So whichever, can, see in, in fact I will say anything which you get here that is like in addition to what you are having because you are generating it from ambient environment. So it is not like you are expanding something and then you are generating. So even some people say that you can even merge more than one technique to harvest the energy. So it is not necessary that I just use triboelectricity. Even you can use triboelectricity in couple with uh, piezoelectricity or in couple with uh, electromagnetic. So any of the technique can be used. Is that fine? Okay. So, yeah. What was the difference between piezo and triboelectricity? Uh, so the, uh, uh, the physics is different, for example, uh, the piezoelectricity comes, uh, so, so like if you take a piezo material and if let's say you apply some strain, like if there is some strain, do you understand strain? Strain is like, or you can think it like this, you are applying some force and because of force <laughs> if there is some deformation in the material. Then there are some material which are known as piezoelectric material in that uh, they basically have some dipoles 
and these dipoles gets aligned in such a way so that a effective charge generation happens and this charge generation results in a current so that is how the piezoelectric piezoelectric material is generating current while in a triboelectric material as i explained you earlier the two electrodes are coming into contact and when they are coming into contact then electron exchange is happening and because of that so so you understand the physics is different the the way uh, current and similarly for electromagnetic okay so the physics is slightly is different otherwise it's fine any other query so i think this is just uh, uh, the explanation of this circuit like basically here that one electrode is this the second electrode is this and what generally happens is this thing comes into contact and once it comes into contact then uh, you, you can you can connect your circuitry between these two electrodes and your circuit becomes complete and that whatever charge is there that charge is kind of taken away from there this is just the waveform and ha huh, i was talking on this slide so this i was telling you how in circuit way i can explain you how you are taking the energy away from the device so these devices whichever is generating this energy right they can be thought of as a capacitor this capacitor is like some equivalent modeling of the device so basically whenever like whether it is a strain or whether it is like the two layers are coming into contact so some charge is coming on that device and that charge can be considered as if this, this charge gets collected in a capacitor now let's say you want to transfer this charge to a battery and battery can be thought of as another capacitor where you can store the charge so now how i will take this charge from this place to the other place without losing it. so do you know of, like have you guys studied about capacitor all of you or not so you guys have not studied but class 12 class 12 right? so none of you are from class 12 okay these okay. topics are from class 12 okay yeah maybe so uh, then i can directly tell you that whenever you take two capacitor and if you directly connect them right later on you will understand this if you take two capacitor and you directly connect it then the charge can go from one capacitor to other capacitor it can go but the only problem is that you also lose some charge in this process so there is this is some lossy process why in this case when you use this this is another component which is known as inductor right in this case the charge transfer happens in a lossless way so you don't lose any charge basically some resonance happens and due to this resonance the complete energy can be transferred from this capacitor to this in inductor through resonance so maybe it, it is it will not make much sense right now because you are not familiar with the capacitor and inductor but i can just tell you that we have designed a circuit which can transfer this charge from the device in a much efficient way to the battery okay so that that can be done using circuit like uh, and this is some example how we are using our device for example let's say here this is essentially that device where one layer is this one layer is this and in fact now if you bend your arm let's say if i attach it to your arm and if i bend my arm then depending upon how much i have bended it the the signals are slightly different so in fact sometimes you can even sense uh your your movement you understand like uh, it it can even be used as a sensor that how much you have bended your hand depending upon what kind of signal is being generated and another way of using this device is for example you can take your shoe and basically we have bifurcated this sole in two parts and in between we have placed this device so now whenever you will move like let's say if you walk right so you will essentially press this because the way you walk is like your uh, back of the feet foot it will go up 
and then down, up and down. So because of that movement, you are again constantly pressing it, releasing it, pressing it, releasing it. And that's how you can actually generate the electricity. Right? So these are like uh, real use cases where you can uh, use such kind of device and you can actually generate uh, the energy using this. Okay? So these are like uh, some of the ideas which I was having. I am like now kind of done with my discussion. If, like now I am uh, keeping the forum for question and answer. So if you guys have any question and answer, then please please do to ask. Not necessarily related to electronics because this is uh, this is also a forum for you to get familiar with us. So even if you have some generic kind of question related to engineering or related to IIT, that is also uh, that can also be answered. Yeah. Uh, so uh, using this example of this device, can we actually generate electricity through walking? Yes. And even like you're speaking, so can a device be generated so as to recognize the vibrations of your voice to generate electricity? Like solar energy, wind energy, uh -huh. we can also use uh, walking and talking etc. Yes, yes. So energy can always be converted from one form into another. The only question is that because these uh, energy sources are very weak, like uh, the, the, how much energy is there, right? So it may happen that see again whatever energy is there and while converting also you will have certain efficiency so at the end you will get whatever energy is present there so but so for example right now these harvesters may not be able to charge your mobile phone right because the amount of energy which you may need to charge your mobile phone is significantly high but think about a sensor which might not need such a uh, such volume of energy, right? Uh, for example, uh, um, let's say let's say you have a sensor in uh, one room, so that if anyone comes into that room, the bulb automatically gets illuminated, right? Such kind of sensor need very uh, less amount of energy, so those kind of sensors can be easily powered using such an energy harvest. But not enough energy can be used to work on big scale operations. Hmm. So the question is, how big your uh, harvester is there? So I think it is scalable. So if you can afford to have a very large device, right? Then obviously the energy will also get scaled. So a mass but usage of this device can lead to more generation of electricity. Like if every person on the earth uses this then we can also power uh, bigger operations using it, right? You can see, uh, the, the answer to that question is there are variety of sources available and every source has uh, like niche application. For example, such kind of like what I can see is for example, solar sun is already there. So many places you would not be needing such a device because in those cases, let's say sun is already there or wind is already there. But for example, if you uh, think about a pacemaker, so pacemaker is going inside your body. You cannot harvest the energy from sun there, like how, how you will do. But inside your body, lot of vibrations are there. So such kind of device make much sense. So, so you understand like not one thing is fit for every application, but you have to figure out the application, you have to see where it makes much sense, and then you have to use it. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so, in the previous slide, you showed that uh, when we flex our muscles uh, differently, so different frequencies come. So, can we use that to uh, make a bio uh, mechanical arm? Yeah, in fact, uh, the reason for showing this is like uh, to uh, design something especially for biosensing or biocontrol. Yeah. So it can be done, but it has to be like refined in a... See, right now when you think, you just think, you miss it out. So right now when you think, you just think in terms of sensing and uh, control. But the sensing and control is also not so straightforward. Why it is not so straightforward? Because, for example, uh, 
in even in a human uh, body let's say if i want to move my arm so actually you know how this happens this this control is not just the movement of muscle there are lot of feedbacks are also involved so we don't realize it but through our muscle as well as through our eye both work simultaneously so we also have this visual feedback we have a feedback to muscles through haptic feedback like let's say if i am moving this muscle and suddenly it uh, uh, like suddenly i let's say strike at something then immediately i will move it back so how this is happening because as as soon as you are touching it some haptic feedback is there that haptic feedback tells you oh some obstacle is there you have to move it back sometimes if you notice it then through visual feedback you move it back so this control is very complicated so you have to actually see that how you will integrate in the same way as it is happening in the human body so that topic is slightly complicated but yes this can be used to control okay so right now the devices which we have designed so uh, 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 we like kind of able to generate let's say uh, in the range of uh, 10 microwatt or so okay so just to give you a comparison because uh, obviously that i i'm not sure if that will make much sense to you if let's say you have a mobile and if you want to charge your mobile it requires the energy in watt and this energy is in microwatt so it is scale of different like you you understand like you will take lot of time but as i already told you there are some sensing circuitry or lot of circuitry which actually operate in even in nanowatt so it's not like that generating energy in microwatt is useless there are use cases where it can be used but not every day right so for that you have to do some more uh, improvement in this so can we generate huge energy from this please see that is a question you, you actually don't want to why you don't want to because see for example for generating huge energy you already have sun you already have a wind so this technique is not a substitute of your energy sources the energy sources are already there this technique is more effective for the use cases where the other techniques cannot be used for example i told you let's say uh, you put sensor at a place where let's say even sunlight is not present let's say wind is also uh, very minimal now and the power requirement is also not very high so in such scenario you can use this kind of an for example inside your body so inside your body uh, this can be a ideal case especially for a bio application but yes these kind of like for example this triboelectric device another place where you can use it uh, maybe inside sea because inside sea when you have these uh, waves so these waves have a lot of vibrational energy so vibrational energy of those waves can be actually harvested using this triboelectric devices or uh, like this kind of energy harvesting device so depending like you have to just see like what are the use case where it make more sense so that that's what i think oh. yes so how much time it took you to uh, become an electric engineer and for what your age when you started okay so uh, i think uh, yeah i was little biased but why i was little biased because uh, my father is also a uh, electronics engineer so i think i saw it from my childhood that uh, there is a person in my home and in fact i think uh, it happens when you are in your family either you are inspired from your father or mother so i think it was very early age maybe i was like uh, 7 or 8 year old when some uh, relative came and he asked what do you want to become and i told him engineer so the answer was even at that age but another reason why i became uh, a engineer is uh, that we don't know uh, uh, 
uh, for sure at that early age. But I used to think like if you are good in math, you become engineer. If you are good in bio, you become uh, doctor. That, that, so I am telling you, this is not actually the correct thing. Like uh, obviously in engineering you require math, but uh, uh, like nowadays even you have biotech uh, engineering. Like a uh, lot of streams are there. So. Like math was like my favorite subject, so that is another reason why I came to engineering. After coming to engineering, I found we don't do that much math. A lot of things have become simple, so we already uh, did the simplification. Yes. So, what was the second question? Um, how was the thinking to become electric? Electrical engineering. And about your PhD. So. If you, uh, if the condition of becoming electrical engineering is through degree, then I took four years because uh, you take four years in doing your B.Tech. Otherwise, by qualification, I don't know at which point you will term that you are an electrical engineer. Right? Even may happen. Even today, I don't know many things. Right? See, the more you study, the more you realize that you don't know a lot of things. Right? This is what happens because now, in fact, I am focusing on a very narrow area. So, as I clearly told, uh, whenever the discussion comes to device, I simply say I don't work in that area. So, you understand that like, the more you start studying, your focus will become narrow, but yeah, in that particular field, you start doing more and more. So, I cannot say that I am a complete electrical engineering. In circuit design, I know something, right? So, that much I can say. And this is a never ending process, like uh, like when I go to class, right, uh, every, you can say that. So every time I, I go to the class, uh, some or other students ask some question and uh, it's not like all the question I can answer, like uh, the question can be asked in many different ways, right. So some, some question uh, force you to think. Uh, in a different way, then you have to come up with an answer. So this is, you understand, like this is a, uh, uh, like you are continuously learning even to your students. The only thing I can say is, once you like uh, go through this experience, now you are well equipped in finding answers. Because through this learning, the only thing which I have learned is how to find the answer, right? So it is not like, I am learning everything, I am just becoming more uh, uh, expert in like where to find the answer, how to find the answer, right? So th that's what actually happens. Otherwise, uh, you start learning these things and uh, as you will move along, you will become more and more expert. So there is no age at which uh, I will say is the ideal age to start. You can start at any age, but just don't go with the trend. Like, try to figure out what you actually like because that is very important. See, I came like although in my family, as I told you, that uh, my father was my father is electronics engineer, but he never forced me to learn electronics. So it is like this is something which came uh, from like. Uh, this was my interest, I went to him, I asked him and then I became interested in that. That's how I came into this field. So if your interest is coming within, then you will grow more. If you just do this because let's say for example, you choose engineering because every other guy is choosing engineering or let's say even within engineering you are choosing some branch because the trend is like this or the jobs are there, that is not a correct. In, in, in fact, this, this thing I can answer you very well, like for example, when you select branch in engineering, right, you will find uh, branches like computer science and electronics, these are preferred more or electrical and the branches like civil engineering, people generally don't choose them at uh, early rank, right. But there are many cases, like at least after uh, going through this route, I can tell you that uh, even inside IIT, the people who make most money are civil engineers. Because the kind of, like the amount of projects they are having, 
their individual project goes in like several crores. Nobody can compete with them. Okay. Yeah. No, it depends. Let's see, civil engineer like one road is getting constructed. This the amount is so huge. How can you compete with them? Right? So, so you understand not everything is like uh, like this market factor. They also change depending upon what you are seeing. Right? And in fact, the growth and option is possible in every field. The only requirement is that you have to become expert. So if you can become expert, every field has a lot of opportunities for you. Let's see, in every field, you, you, you need experts, you need like professors, you need uh, uh, people at different level. So it may happen that at in entry level or at initial level, in certain speed, the requirement is more. For example, in software job, at entry level, the requirement is more because of that people think of oh, getting job is much easier in the software domain. That's why people are going for computer science. But at an expert level, the requirement is almost equal in all the fields. So at an expert level, you don't need too many. You need only certain. So if you can become expert, every field has plenty of opportunities for you. So my suggestion is go with your interest because if you are going with your interest, there is a higher probability that you will become expert. If you are not going with your interest, then you can just be a common person, like you will lead a common life. But if you go with your interest, you will actually enjoy your work also. Like for example, let me tell you, I am today here and uh, Government is paying me a salary and the salary is actually very good. And they are paying me for doing what? Which I like. So even if they are not paying, I would be doing the same thing. So it is like just they pay you and you do what you are like, liking. So what can be better than that? So, so that's why it is very important you start doing what you are liking and choose, choose uh, which you actually should like from within your heart. See, I am coming on Saturday, right? Saturday is officially a holiday for us. Why I am coming like this? If I am not liking this thing, I would not be here. You understand? So this 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 thing comes from interest on. Okay. Any other thing? So, so would you give a brief analysis of both of these jobs, PEG? Okay. So, uh, so this PEG and PEG are just uh, the different kind of uh, uh, you can say mechanism like one is triboelectric mechanism and one is piezoelectric. So P denotes the piezoelectricity. So in fact, in this device, we we not only had triboelectric generator, rather we also have piezoelectric because we thought anyway the vibrations are happening. So if we put a piezoelectric here also, so through that we will also get some electricity. And uh, whenever they will come into contact, through tribal electricity also you will get electricity. So I see the amplitude in the PEG is uh, quite uh, more than uh, Yes, mm. yes. So that happens because of uh, the different mechanism. So actually, uh, uh, see, see the problem is right now you are not much familiar with the capacitor. But to understand it, actually you have to go to a capacitor only, but let me explain you how this happens. So the charge stored in capacitor is given by our expression C into V, where C is the capacitance and V is the voltage which you get. So now actually what happens is this plate, when it, when vibrations are happening, it starts moving far from each other due to vibration. So now when it starts moving far from each other, its capacitance actually reduces. As the plate distance becomes more and more, the capacitance becomes less. Now if your charge is constant and capacitance is reducing, what actually happens is voltage increases. Right? So because of this phenomena, here you can get even much higher voltage if the distance between the plate becomes more and more. So if, because the charge is constant, as you taking these plates far away from each other, the capacitance is reducing and the voltage is increasing. So in fact, there are EEG devices which can generate the voltages up to 800 volt also. 
right? That is possible. While in piezoelectricity, the phenomena is different, so you will find the voltages generated are in the range of maximum up to let's say eight to ten volts, not even higher. Where is all these energies being stored, particularly? So, uh, in the device, actually, if you uh, try to make a equivalent model, then uh, uh, this. Uh, device can be modeled like a capacitor, but if you ask me in terms of material, so the energy is basically stored within material. So, see, within material you have electrons, right? Are there chances of losing these things? Like, if I am generating the energy, is there a chance that the, it is being stored in the material? Can I lose it? So, uh, obviously, if the, see this alignment of charge is only till the time that stress is there. So let's say if that stress is taken away, then it will get realigned into whatever uh, way they were earlier. So basically you will lose it. So the question is, you have to take it out before that realignment happens. So that's where the role of circuitry comes. So what you do is, this realignment is happening, the moment it happens, you extract it, and then you allow it to go back and then come back into that situation. Right? Or, or you can think it in this way. Let's say this energy is generating in this fashion where this is like voltage waveform. So here you can see that uh, voltage is in one direction. So basically it will charge your capacitor. But again the capacitor you are not familiar. So, uh, in the form of condenser of the fan. Ah. They have seen that condenser. Or you can think it like this. So let me not call a battery. Rather you think it like this. That you have some bucket. And when this amplitude is positive. I am putting water in this bucket. And when this amplitude is negative. I am taking the water out from this bucket. So now let's say if I like this is my tap and I put a bucket here. So now because I am adding water and taking it out. So you are not net, net effect is zero. Yeah. Right? But now let's say I do another thing. I operate within this, I wait for this cycle. So the water goes inside the bucket, right? And as soon as the bucket is full. I kind of, uh, or even if it is not full, I take out that water and put it somewhere else. Now in this cycle, you expect water to be taken away from this bucket. But there is nothing in the bucket, so nothing will happen. So you understand, so through this way, this is kind of known as rectification. So you are rectifying thing and then you are uh, taking that energy at some other place and that's how you so I gave a very crude analogy, this is not completely correct, but at least it will make some, some sense. Okay. So, yeah. so as you told us about, so we can use our internal body energy or the C rate type uh, for the energy he chose. So sir, if we use those things, uh, are there any possibility where that uh, we can have them as an energy source for like those solar panels and solar energy? The energy source for what? So like uh, for using of lights or anything. No, no, sorry, I didn't get the question. So, uh, uh, you told us about like uh, um, previous conversation that uh, you, uh, we can use our internal body energy or our C tides or anything like that. See, there are vibrations are there. So, I said your internal body also a lot of vibrations are there because your heart is there, it is pumping, so vibrations are there. So, uh, uh, as such uh, vibrations, so you can use it for uh, energy generation, like you told us there can be more possible the C energy, C energy, like that. So, so can we use that uh, use this as energy source, like a certain type of energy? Yes, you can use it. Why not? So, once this energy is converted into electrical energy, energy will charge the battery. Now, this battery can be used for any photographic use you want. The only question is, what is the capacity in which you have gathered this energy? If let's say this energy is sufficient for running your particular device, then you can always do it. So right now the only limitation is currently as I told our energy extraction is not so high. So it will not make much sense to let's say operate your mobile 
uh, with that, but at least I think application can work. So, so in future, we got to discover that we can use it. Huh, in, in fact, it may happen that in future, you come up with materials which actually can give you that material property. It may happen that it will give you a much heavy amount of energy. Right? Because everything just also depends upon the type of material you are using. Okay, what you have is, you have a mechanical body, but more. okay. Depends how much energy you want. Like right? for example, uh, running a motor, uh, I think that energy can be significant. So that energy at least likely has because any mechanical movement now. That mechanical movement requires more energy compared to electronic circuits. See, any mechanical motion energy requirement are high, but for sensing, even within robots, you need a lot of sensing mechanisms. Let's say if you if you want to make your robot, uh, let's say you want to detect a obstacle so that it avoids collision. For that you need some sensors, and even for your motor, you may need some control circuitry. So those circuitry it may provide energy, but the actuation of that motor that actually requires much higher energy. So that I am not sure. So the reason is, uh, for example, as I told, let's say think about uh, pacemaker inside your body, right? So how you will, let's say, even if you uh, got the uh, energy from the sun in form of a battery, how you will connect this battery? To your pacemaker. You need some wire now, right? So, is, is it okay? Like a human is carrying a battery and then wire is going inside the body. That's not very practical. So, rather, what I will do is I will design the circuitry along the pacemaker. I will put that pacemaker inside the human body, and now everything is like internally generated, internally formed. So, one so, in the interest of time, here, let's uh, first of all, you know, I want to thank Prof. Ankit. They can address you and you can surround from Ankit. Uh, I hope he is not in the yeah. mm -hmm. yeah, okay. But I should be like this. Those who want to leave, they can come. So those who want to ask more questions, please come to me. Sound, 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 sound,